Welcome back. I'm Michael Bull, and this is the Commercial Real Estate Show. If you'd like to know the absolute latest on any commercial real estate related topics, check out our on demand show podcast. For example, we recently interviewed Mitch Rochelle and Andy Warren, both with PWC, about the PWC ULI Emerging Trends Report for 2014. If you want to get an idea of what's going to happen in commercial real estate in 2014, you'll want to watch that show. It's available on the show website, it's available on YouTube. Uh, just go to commercial realestateshow.com. Well, today we're discussing real estate financing. Uh, please welcome Tom Walsh, Senior Vice President, Grandbridge Real Estate Capital, an arm of BB&T, one of the top 10 banks in the country. Tom, thanks for joining us. Good morning. Glad to be here. Also, please welcome Mark Hancock, Senior Vice President, Mid-Market Commercial Real Estate Group with Bank of North Georgia, a $28 billion Southeast Regional Financial Institution, a division of Synovus. Mark, thanks for joining us today. Michael, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, guys, I'd like to start with your interest rate per Predictions. You set rates, right? You're bankers, you're lenders, right? <laughs> Every day. Okay. Well, I know you study the market, right? And uh, so you have an idea of what you think is going to happen, Tom? Right now, uh, barring a macroeconomic calamity, I think on the Treasury side, we're just going to see a slow rise. Mm -hmm. um, I'm in the camp that thinks LIBOR just can't stay at 25 or 20 basis points forever. But uh, right now, the economy is just not doing well enough, you know, to have the, the Fed move that rate. So for now, steady. Steady. OK. All right. uh, Michael, we're in recovery mode, not expansion mode. And the Fed uh, is going to be hard pressed to start tapering anytime soon. I think the change in chairmanship to Yellen uh, this uh, early part of 2014 will also bring caution to take on liquidity out of the marketplace. It's, uh, it will be Yellen's recovery and her expansion, and she can't lose it. <laughs> okay. So you expect slow interest rate increases, so no jolt there. Correct. Okay. And a lot of people are concerned about Fannie and Freddie and the future of Fannie and Freddie. Tom, what, what do you think? Well, I preface this by saying nobody really knows what will happen with Fannie and Freddie, and it may very well be the Congress that is elected in the 2014 midterm elections that eventually decides that. Um, if you go on the premise that the government uh, is incentivized to support affordable housing, which most people seem on both sides of the aisle seem to believe that's to be the case, there will be, I believe, an agency in the future, whether it's one or two, and, and whether it's Fannie or Freddie, whether it's a combined one, whether it's one of the two, uh, yet to be determined. Um, Freddie Mac historically has been a little bit more of the entrepreneurial spirit company between the two. Um, it wouldn't surprise me uh, if Freddie made moves to privatize in the future and, and get away from the government guarantee on that. Fannie, on the other hand, has been a little more of a governmental company over the past and and if i had to pick one who would be the likely successor to stay in that in that mode i would say fannie mae is the likely one um, but in any case i believe there will be a government supported agency there to support affordable housing because at the end of the day there's no more affordable housing than apartments um, in any sector of the market uh, apartments are always a more affordable alternative than single family in a similar location um, and the government appears to be committed to that. So I, I think there will be an agency going forward. I'm not sure what the model will be, um, but there'll be a government-supported system in place, I believe. Okay. And how are the caps and, and changes in Freddie and Fannie affecting the marketplace? Are they still the lender of choice for, say, apartments? Um, you know, the cap on or the caps on growth, which basically have Fannie and Freddie mm -hmm. effectively shrinking multifamily production mm -hmm. right now, you're starting with such a high number that, that, that shrinkage is a relative term. I mean, if, if you go from 30 to 27, 27 is still a huge number. I mean, so, you know, it's all relative on the shrinkage side. Um, right now, you know, um, there is a commitment uh, of, of being in the market, of staying liquid. Both the Fannie and Freddie are still doing huge numbers um, in, re in any relative terms, huge numbers. Um, however, they're not alone in the market like they were three years ago. Okay. Uh, life insurance companies, um, 
uh, at, 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 at the middle part of the leverage scale, maybe up at the top of the leverage scale on really high quality stuff. Life companies are stealing a lot of business away from the agencies. Uh, locking rated application is a big advantage for them. Um, the CMBS market uh, has stepped in to, to grab what I would say the quality spectrum in the market right under Fannie and Freddie. That really would be the biggest segment of the market. You know, there, there's more C apartments in this country than there are A apartments. Um, and, and so each 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 lender. Well, I, I need a place to live. You know. I yeah, that's right. I live that's somewhere. right. <laughs> <laughs> but each lender category has their place in the market yeah. right now. The, the market for apartments has never been more liquid, um, and it's because it's not just Fannie and Freddie right now. Though they, they're both garnering huge market share right now, but the life insurance companies have made huge inroads into the multifamily side. The CMBS market is doing a lot of multifamily lending right now, so it, it's probably never been more liquid than it is right now. And Mark Banks are doing loans on apartments too, right? now. Yeah. We are. Uh, construction lending, uh, repositionings, uh, keeping us busy, and uh, we love the agencies because they're, they're our exit, And uh, but yeah, multifamily is uh, bread and butter right now. Well, it's glad to see banks loan the money. Can I get some money for lunch today? I mean, like, <laughs> as long as you pay it back. <laughs> oh, we're supposed to pay loans <laughs> back. I remember that oh. from the old days, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I thought the downturn, that's where the equity was, oh, right? <laughs> the capital stack includes, includes a guarantee. Yeah. And you mentioned CMBS. You know, how much of a, a part of the debt market in 2014 is CMBS? It, getting, getting bigger every year, like Steve mentioned um, mm -hmm. earlier. Um, that market has found its footing, I would mm -hmm. say, after a couple rocky years and CMBS 2.0 started. Um, right now, the B piece buyer market is deeper than it's been in, in any recent history at all. And competition in the B piece market is really the best possible thing for the CMBS market. Mm -hmm. um, keeps everybody more honest, keeps anyone from really dictating market terms. Um, I, I would expect nothing but growth in CMBS going forward. Um, they're they're better at it than they were in 1.0 you know, before the recession. Um, they're they're more they're more conservative. They're smarter. They they did learn lessons uh, in 1.0, and and you know they're putting that in play right now. They didn't learn too many lessons to not do loans, did they? I mean. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I mean, right now it's probably an ideal time to do loans. I, mean, I, um, I had to go to yeah. get a loan from somebody that was in charge of workouts for the last three or four years. <laughs> yeah, that, workouts will jade you as a lender, without yeah. a doubt. So. Yeah, that's true. Well, what about underwriting? Uh, you know, Steve had mentioned that underwriting has eased from a year ago. What What do you see uh, every day? Right now, uh, the underwriting is pretty consistent across the board in the CMBS market. Um, I would say it's not over, certainly not overly aggressive. Mm -hmm. If you compare today's underwriting standards and the underwriting standards in place in 2006 before the market melted down, there's no comparison. Mm -hmm. Much, much more conservative today. It is slowly loosening up, loosening up as we go forward. Part of that driven by the competition in the B-piece market. Right. You know, the B-piece buyers can't dictate the terms any, anymore. Right. They have to accept a little risk, you know, going forward in those pools right now. Um, but it's it's still not crazy underwrite. We're not going back to pre-recession times at all. Okay. All right. Well, we're going to take a short break here. When we get back, we'll talk about more sources of money and which source will be best for your asset. I'm Michael Bull. This is the Commercial Real Estate Show. We'll be right back. The Commercial Real Estate Show is brought to you in part by your friends at Bull Realty. When your business requires proven performance, visit bullrealty.com or call 800-408-BULL. Welcome back. I'm Michael Bull, and this is the Commercial Real Estate Show. Well, each week here, we focus on a topic of interest to business owners, investors, and real estate professionals. Be sure to catch topics of special interest to you. Sign up for a once-a-week email announcing the show topic at commercialrealestateshow.com. Well, today we're talking about financing with Tom Walsh with Grandbridge Real Estate Capital and Mark Hancock with Bank of North Georgia, a division of Synovus. And guys, I like to talk about sources for different property types that that as a, a borrower or sponsor that, that we might want to consider for our properties. And first, let's start with, with CMBS. What type of uh, properties and, and loan situations should we think about for a CMBS loan? Uh, CMBS will do all of the major property types, the four food groups, 
plus hospitality, plus self-storage, plus mobile home parks. Um, not a lot of specialty property works very well in CMBS. The, the reason why you would do CMBS versus another lending source quite often is driven by leverage level. Um, if, if you need to get up to the sort of the top of the leverage stack, say for most properties, that being 75%, um, CMBS is, is going to be your, your player at that level. Um, the life insurance companies who are also doing all of those food groups, um, they're going to cap out usually in the 65 to 70 percent range at most. The exception of that would be for high-end apartments where the life insurance companies will go to 75 percent. But the CMBS market is mostly serving uh, the, the part of the market that just needs higher leverage. That would be the simplest way to explain it. Okay. And these life insurance loans, are these all non-recourse? Uh, by and large, I, I would say any life insurance company loan above $5 million is done on a pure non-recourse basis. Some of the smaller life insurance company loans, say from $5 million down to $1 million, we will see a fair amount of those deals uh, at least attempting to get some level of recourse. Those life insurance companies found that they could get recourse during the recession, um, and they decided they liked it. Um, and so a lot of them are still trying to get, even if it's a small piece, a 20 or 25 percent recourse level. Um, if you're lower leveraged, though, even in the smaller deals, you'll be non-recourse there also. And the rates are going to be similar? Yeah, I, I mean, you get, uh, you, know, you get a little more competitive as you get larger mm -hmm. in the life company space. Um, right now, the life insurance companies, by and large, are slightly under the CMBS pricing mm -hmm. on, on similar you know, property types. Uh, but loan size does matter. You, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, a, a $20 million loan from one of the major life companies is going to get priced tighter than a $3 million loan from one of the smaller companies. Okay, so I'll have a, a better chance of getting lunch money from Mark if I go to Bones uh, Steaks House for, for lunch rather than McDonald's? Yes, <laughs> most definitely. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, and, and what if I've got a, a, a property in a secondary tertiary market? Uh, will life insurance co companies look at that? Um, some will, some won't. Okay. Um, that, that, that's one of the criteria. I, I use an example here, you know, in, in our area in the southeast would be a, a Montgomery or a Macon or, or, or a market like that, you know, that's not a real big market. Uh, some life insurance companies are just don't do any tertiary markets at all. Other ones like tertiary markets. CMBS, by and large, is ambivalent to that as long as the numbers work. And Mark, when do I go to a bank for a loan besides getting my lunch money? <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow. We'll take you tomorrow. And what types of properties and, and uh, things are you guys considering? And what do you like? Well, uh, multifamily is obviously the hot segment. And we look at a lot of multifamily. Um, we're looking at retail. I'm looking at some repositioning office uh, buildings. Uh, industrial is a little difficult. You're looking, but what, what are you closing? <laughs> <laughs> I've closed uh, a few office repositionings this year. Uh, and regarding office, I'm, I'm fairly bullish. Uh, lack of deliveries uh, here in our metro area. Mm -hmm. um, while we also have uh, improving absorptions. So um, I, I'm fairly bull bullish on it. So. And what are some sample loans uh, that you closed as far as rates and terms uh, in, in the banking world recently? Uh, you know, obviously, we're, we're bridge lenders, uh, three to five year money, and on those repositionings, um, generally five year money, a couple years interest only would be pretty standard, and our rates would range from five year, depending on when I closed it, four and a half to five and a quarter. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, today's market, given uh, swap rates where they are, we're, we're actually pricing a lot of fixed rate swaps, which we can come in lower than that into the high threes, low fours. And loan to value ratio ranges? On office, uh, up to 65 for the re repositions we're talking about. You get into some real class A and some real occupancy, we obviously can go a lot higher. I only have class A, so. <laughs> and how about non-recourse? I hear banks are doing some non-recourse. Banks are doing non-recourse, and I will say that philosophically, every commercial bank uh, post-recession has had a backroom conversation on, w on what the value of a guarantee really is. Uh, in my personal opinion, my uh, non-scientific research is worth about five to eight percent mm -hmm. and uh, so my position is we're better at 65 non-recourse and 75 recourse uh, but this is it's a debate driven argument and there's no winner or loser uh, but a lot of the banks in town are doing non-recourse yeah the, the leverage today is 60 to 65 oh, great well that's something to look at well we'll have more for you in just a moment on current financing trends I'm Michael Bull and this is the commercial real estate show we'll be right back 
The Commercial Real Estate Show is brought to you in part by France Media. France Media provides exposure to the world of commercial real estate. Visit francemediainc.com or call 404-832-8262. Welcome back. I'm Michael Bull, and this is the Commercial Real Estate Show. You're invited to check out Commercial Real Estate Show TV. That's right. We're on YouTube now. Just search for the channel Commercial Real Estate Show on YouTube. Well, today we're talking about financing with Tom Walsh and Mark Hancock. And uh, Mark, I'd like to ask you guys about uh, distress. Um, I mean, I hear the banks are, are through most of their non-performing notes and loans, and, and there's very little distress left. What do you see out there? First, I just want to say it's a pleasure to be on here with Tom Walsh. We go back to the Reagan years a very long time ago. He looks a lot better than he did in the 80s. He had an Eddie Van Halen uh, mullet haircut back then. It was not appropriate. Um, but it's good to be here. You're a lot smarter now, too. By I am a lot, smarter. a lot smarter. And he's now an icon. He's an icon. That's right. So, so. Uh, regarding distress, uh, banks are publicly traded. We're regulated by uh, multiple agencies. And we're required uh, to clean our balance sheets. And for for the most part, six years after the start of uh, the recession, uh, we have done that. Banks have pretty much done that. And banks are in growth mode trying to lend lend money. Uh, The bank analysts are looking for earnings growth and uh, improvement to net interest margins. So the the issues with distressed assets really aren't so much on the commercial bank side. The concern I have is on the CMBS uh, uh, special servicing side. Uh, we know here in Atlanta there's a high number of uh, distressed assets coming due for mature immaturities from uh, 15 through 17. And I'm concerned about what, what happens when those properties come on the market, what happens to uh, cap rates and, and values. Yeah. Most definitely true. You know, there's a lot of properties out there in CMBS world in the existing pools that are able to pay their debt service but are not going to be able to be paid off at the end. The values are just not there. And, and that's a looming problem that starts to really accelerate in 2015. I think 15, 16, and 17 are the three big years for maturities. Uh, still a little bit unknown as to how that's gonna be handled. There, there are some financing programs out there right now that will get you to 85%, um, which will be a big help for people. You know, that's a sort of an AB, you know, first mez kind of combo kind of deal. Um, but what remains to be seen is the economics in place and how that relates to a borrower's willingness to cut a check at the closing. And you know, these are non-recourse loans. Every CMBS loan is a non-recourse loan. So, so it's, the borrower has to do a serious financial analysis, a little bit of a psychological analysis, mostly financial, in deciding whether they want to support this property for the long run if that means writing a check to pay it off at, you know, at the closing. Yeah, and they're going to have to look at bringing some cash from somewhere, aren't they? Yeah, it, it's, it's either going to be their own. It's, it's going to be a secondary investor you know, coming into the deal. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it's, it's going to be an interesting situation to watch going forward. Yeah. Eventually, those assets have to be right-sized to market. Uh, either they're paid down. Mm-hmm. by the by the borrower or they're sold at, at market value yeah today's market value yeah and some of what what we've done as brokers and, pro- and brokers around the country is we're able to bring investors to bring that cash to the table and bring the original spot leave the original sponsor in place and let them do the management and leasing and, and keep the project going uh, what other tips do you guys have for a, a borrower that may be in a situation where he's, he's got a, a loan coming due and and it's not going to support the the loan amount um and <laughs> I, I say go to Grandbridge <laughs> <laughs> and go uh, go early. Go early. Go early. Okay. Uh, it, it's kind of funny. Um, I mean, my impression is the CMBS industry does not have as good a handle on that situation as you would think they do. Mm-hmm. As sophisticated and electronic as that industry is, you know, a, a property that's been paying its m- monthly payment for the last five years is a little bit out of sight, out of mind with them. And they may not have quite the handle on the fact that they have a $10 million loan on a property that's worth eight and a half. Um, so go early. You, you know, call that master servicer. Let them know early, hey, I've, I've got a potential problem brewing here on my maturity 18 months from now. Let's work together on it. I'm not promising that they're going to work with you at all. 
but it's a whole lot better than waiting until 60 days before maturity to raise your hand and say, I can't pay my loan off. Yeah. The, the capital stack has a lot of layers to it, and you need to uh, address every layer, not just senior lender level. But um, you know, Maz is out there. Maz is playing again. Uh, you can bring a new equity at a higher preferred return. There's a lot of, a lot of slices, uh, ways to slice it to find a way. Right. Okay. And we touched on it earlier, but I'd like to get a little deeper into it because I think it's a concern of a lot of property owners right right now is is the underwriting for these type of loans when they're when they're going to get these loans. You know, what are you seeing for debt coverage ratios, and uh, what else in underwriting are you seeing today? Right now, if you talk to CMBS industry, mm-hmm. which the expectation is that's going to be the people who will take these loans out more than likely. It's a debt yield driven market, which which is a concept that we didn't even talk about before the recession. Mm-hmm. They're all on debt yield now, much more so than debt coverage. Um, on on apartments, they're real aggressive on debt yield, getting you know, way down into the eights. Um, on the other property types, though, not quite as aggressive. A lot of uh, say nine and a half or higher mm-hmm. on debt yield. Um, you're going to find uh, that the underwriting is is as is based underwriting. Mm-hmm. So far, no one is really going on pro forma at all. It is in-place cash flow. In-place cash flow is the easiest thing to underwrite. That's one of the reasons why we do that. Um, but right now, almost all the loans being made are, are done on in-place cash flow. That can be kind of your problem in the future uh, as far as the CMBS loans paying off these old CMBS loans that were done on very aggressive terms back in the mid-2000s. Yeah. Well, that's sad to hear as a broker that, uh, you know, I'd like investors and lenders to look at my pro forma. <laughs> well, it's interesting, you know, I think uh, this is one of the best times to buy commercial real estate, in my opinion. You know, uh, you know, we're in a recovery and uh, like you said, we're not in expansion yet. Well, maybe we are with apartments, but it's a great time to buy uh, properties and I think it's a great time to, to do loans. And we'll have more about uh, loans and some tips for you. I'm Michael Bull. This is the Commercial Real Estate Show. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Welcome back. I'm Michael Ball, and this is the Commercial Real Estate Show. Thanks for sharing the show with your friends on Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter. We do very much appreciate it, and I bet your friends and followers do as well. Well, today we're talking about financing with Mark Hancock and, and Tom Walsh. And gentlemen, I'd like to get some tips from you. If I'm a borrower and I'd like to get the best offers I can from various lenders, what type of process should I get involved in and what sort of package should I put together? Well, regarding the package, the packages I get, and I get in, uh, multiple packages every day, uh, some of them might contain 20 pages of pictures and one page of a uh, combined rent roll and performa, uh, no historicals. and uh, Pictures it, of my family. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna, it, it, every loan I, 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 I close, I obviously walk through the property and I look at interior and exterior. I, I don't need the pictures. Mm-hmm. Uh, and with Google Earth, you can easily find it. Uh, I need more analysis and uh, historical, three-year historicals and some uh, in, in your performance. And what I like to see more of in these packages is real uh, solid data on supply and demand. Some packages might have a lot on supply, some might have a lot on demand, but not on both. Uh, so we're looking for more analysis. And we also want access to, the, to either the Excel workbook or the Argus package so that we can work uh, in the spreadsheets that saves our underwriters a ton of time. That's nice. That's a great idea. Great, great tip. Some other tips, Tom? That's an interesting point because we, we have some lenders now that when we send them a PDF package, immediately ask for the same information in Excel mm-hmm. because they want to manipulate it themselves. Uh, in addition to what Mark said, um, keep numbers up to date uh, in, in November. If I'm getting a, a package that has a, a year to date through August, that's too old. I need a year to date through September, October. Keep good numbers on a monthly basis. Most every property type now, especially on a trailing 12 basis, lenders want to see monthly columns. We don't want to see a full year's worth because everyone's looking at trending. Mm-hmm. And that's generally to the borrower's advantage because most trending today is positive. That's right. You know, so, so, so do monthly. Uh, keep good records. Keep your personal financial statement and your REO mm-hmm. schedule relatively up to date if you send me one in november 2013 and it's june 30th 2012 Mm -hmm. that's kind of old i thought you were gonna say Uh, oh eight no but i I mean (laughs) it should be up to date again most people's reo schedules are getting better 
Right. So keep it up to date. You know, you know, show show the good news in how your portfolio is doing, and keep your PFS up to date. Right. Your personal financial statement. Yeah. That's a good tip. And I like your tip, Mark, about the trends in in the market. That's one of the things that that we do when we're marketing properties is to show, hey, what's the the vacancy trend for that that property type in that sector? You know, and and what's the trend for rates there? So you can so the investor needs to know that. Well, guess what? The lender's investing more than the investor, right? right. You're looking <laughs> multifamily construction today yeah. uh, here in, uh, in Metro Atlanta. Yeah, we get packages all the time and they give us occupancy rates and current rents, but uh, quantifying what's under construction, what's planned, uh, what's in the process of trying to find financing, that needs to be, quali- that's, our, that's our supply number. We yeah. need to quantify. That's a good tip. And, Tom? And if your borrower doesn't know that information and wants to come out of the ground with a property, that's <laughs> problematic. That is. Yeah. Tom, give us a, a um, loan that you've done recently uh, in terms of okay uh, we did an interesting deal here in in Atlanta's most desirable in-town neighborhood Um, it was actually eight addresses uh, all in the same neighborhood Uh, I think the largest of the properties might have been 26 units Mm -hmm. it totaled it totaled a little over a hundred units did it with a life insurance company uh, 10-year deal 25-year AM schedule. At that time, the rate locked in about the four and a half range, but it, it had a, a refi and a purchase component to it, made it a little bit complicated. Um, life insurance insurance company stepped up and got it done. Great, Mark, Tom. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Great to be here. We appreciate it. And uh, you're invited to join us next week. We have interviews from uh, NAR, National Association of Realtors Conference, in San Francisco. You don't want to miss that. So thanks for joining us today. I'm Michael Bull. Until next week, be sure that you always lead, learn, and laugh, and join us for the Commercial Real Estate Show. The Commercial Real Estate Show is brought to you by Atlanta Office Liquidators, new and used furniture liquidators. France Media, Publications and Conferences, and Bull Realty Commercial Brokerage, a great place to do business. For more information on these companies or to access additional podcasts, videos, or blogs, visit commercialrealestateshow.com.